Right, uh, good afternoon, just, uh, and welcome to the talk by RiskS Open. Uh, so first, some obvious question is, who on earth am I? Um, I'm not actually from Rule, uh, I'm helping out uh, Rule today because Steve uh, is not able to attend and uh, Ben is manning the stand. So I'm Robert Sproson, uh, you've also heard me refer to as Spro, which is my abbreviation of my surname. So uh, that's the first question out of the way. I'm going to talk through some things that you might have missed or that have happened since the last Wakefield show. Um, I'm pretty fast at talking, so we'll go through the last 12 months uh, in about a quarter of an hour, no problems. There are some things that are new that have either just come out today or yesterday, uh, and there are a few things that we can look at into the immediate future, uh, as well as how you might be able to uh, uh, muck in and, and help out with risk Open, open, which is entirely, um, entirely based on volunteer time. So there's, there's no full time, there's no, there's no company headquarters, uh, there's no massive office uh, full of developers working full time on this, it is all uh, volunteers. So let's wind the clock back to last Wakefield um, and just a few weeks after that we uh, raised a glass to BASIC, so not BBC BASIC, BASIC the programming language uh, which hit its 50th birthday in May 2014 and uh, Open helped celebrate that by releasing uh, what's known as PICO as in very tiny for any scientists uh, what PICO is usually used for uh, and that uh, runs on the Raspberry Pi and it boots up immediately into a command prompt just like a BBC Model B did uh, running BASIC in Teletext mode 7 uh, albeit with half a gigabyte of RAM so you uh, need to write quite a lot of BASIC to fill that up but uh, that was, that was uh, what, what happened back in May very shortly after that in July my personal uh, my personal favourite game uh, was Hopper, using that with BBC Micro, uh, there's a risk rest version of that written by Simon Foster, and he very kindly agreed to release that as open source, so that now appears on all of the risk rest open hard disk images for anyone who wants to while away the hours uh, trying to navigate uh, mock turtles and uh, crocodile. Is it crocodile? No, crocodile's not shown on that. And so on the higher levels you have to dodge a crocodile and a snake as well. And then, same month, July was busy, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation released the Model B Plus, which is very similar, uh, is this a Mark II actually, uh, very similar to the um, original Model B, uh, except it's got four USB ports now, the original one only had two, which of course meant if you had a keyboard and a mouse, you'd run out of sockets. So the, uh, the Model B Plus added an extra two USB sockets, and they swapped down to a teensy weensy micro SD card instead of the original full size SD card which personally I always found that I snapped that off because it was uh, it flapped about in the wind quite a lot. So that was uh, July 2014. There were a few tweaks needed to make RiskOS work on that uh, because the slight differences between the way that the micro SD card and a full size SD card works. For example, there's no write protect tab on the side of it. So you need some way of knowing whether you permit writes to the disk because you don't have a little plastic tab anymore. Moving forward to August, um, the, uh, well, it's actually slightly after that too, in this show at London, October 2014, a new version of the desktop development environment was released, and that's the compiler, the debugger, uh, the assembler, the linker, basically all of the tools that I use to actually compile the OS. Um, so that was a, a big pile of updates to both, both in bug fixes, but more importantly, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on, uh, many hundreds of hours were spent dragging the documentation into a slightly more uh, recent format. So uh, the original documentation that was shipping prior to that was all written for the, um, basically it was risk West 3 era uh, documentation for the, the development tools. So it didn't quite marry up with the implementation. The, the, the compiler that you're actually buying was much more recent, had more features than the, than the uh, book that it came with on the, the memory stick. So uh, a lot of work went into updating that. And then at the far end of my scale, January 2015 this year, seemed appropriate, 2015, uh, Rule uh, opened a matching pot for the bounty scheme. So the, the bounties are ways that you can show your support for SOS Open by 
uh, investing in uh, a key bit of OS functionality that you would like to see added. Uh, and hopefully, if there's a, a bounty hunter that agrees to the amount that you've uh, collected in that bounty pot, they will then collect and then go and implement that. Because there are a lot of things, uh, I'm speaking for me personally, the bits that I help out with with RiskOS have to fit in the bounds of a weekend. It can't take more than two afternoons. Anything that's more complicated than two afternoons, I can't touch it because I'm afraid I'm doing a full-time job during the week and my eyeballs would fall out of my head <laughs> if I stared out at the computer anymore because I, I do a lot of stuff in CAD software. So the bounty scheme is a way that people can reasonably take like a week or two off work and still be uh, still be able to justify doing work on some of the really big stuff. So there's, there's upgrades to file core sitting waiting in there. What's up? The one that's brought up off the top of mind. Uh, updates to uh, supporting the um, newer instruction sets in the compiler. These are all things that are, um, you, you could easily spend a week just reading the information, trying to remember what it was that you need to change without ever actually touching a line of code. So they're, they're big, complicated things, and it would be great to get some movement on, um, but otherwise, don't fit into a weekend. And the good news is, hence the big pile of cash, which if they were, if they were dollar notes, it would be roughly right for dollar notes. Uh, uh, £2,270 was donated. So in total, in that, just in January this this year, £4,285 was donated, which, to put that into context, exceeds all of the donations for the previous three years. So in one month, 36 months worth of money appeared. So that's a, that's a great achievement. It would be really nice to be able to... Uh, well, it would be really nice to keep that up, but uh, to at least uh, capitalise on that. So the two bounties that are running at the moment are the EDID monitor support. So you can, like you saw when I put the laptop in here, my laptop somehow knows that it's plugged into a projector and has switched screen modes to whatever the projector is trying to do. So that's the thing that most RISC-OS hardware can support. Uh, we just don't have any software to do it at the moment. Uh, the other one that's active at the moment is an upgrade to the JPEG rendering software that's in a module called Sprite Extend. So some of the newer um, JPEG formats, for example, uh, interlace, progressive arithmetic <coughs> encoding JPEGs that you find on the internet um, can't be uh, displayed, for example, in, in Paint and Draw because that it has an older version of the standard. Uh, so those two are ongoing at the moment as a as an <coughs> ongoing result of these donations. To February, so if you were at the South West show, uh, you may have heard, oh, I did bring, this genuinely is a Mark II, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation then released the Mark II Pi, which does look very similar. It has the same four USB sockets and the same micro SD socket on the back, but it has a slightly faster processor, 900 megahertz, so uh, obviously the, the desktop's slightly more fluid. Uh, one gigabyte of RAM, in case 512 wasn't already enough, uh, but still only 25 quid. Buy a RISC-OS computer with a gig of RAM for 25 quid. I think that's, that's pretty impressive. One little wrinkle on there is the quad-core uh, ARM Cortex-A7. Uh, at the moment, RISC-OS is definitely single-core. It didn't really know what to do with the other three cores. So at some point in the future, and maybe that would be a subject, a great subject for a bounty, uh, would be able to make use of all those other three cores. Um, the really simple example that I always give, because it's an endless score of frustration to me, and no disrespect to David Pilling, is when I'm zipping up a file, suddenly everything slows down or the or desktop freezes. <coughs> I've got three spare computers running at 900 megahertz. Why can't they do the zipping up and leave me to move the windows around? So that, that's a really obvious, you know, tangible benefit from having a multi-core system is you can farm off computing jobs that would otherwise gum up, uh, gum up the desktop. And squeaked in at the bottom there uh, at the show, in the Southwest show, uh, a combined uh, updated release candidate 14 SD card was released because obviously we needed to be able to support this new Mark II. So that's uh, a combined SD card image that works with the Model A, Model B, Model B Plus, Mark II, and I know that Chris has a compute module it does no work with that. I don't have one of those. Yes. Yes, good. Okay, <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> well, that was good. That's a uh, bit uh, immediate beta, beta testing feedback. So, yeah, the compute module uh, is also supported now, which I think uh, is probably what, if um, when Chris Evans is here later this afternoon, I think that's what he's hoping to use in a laptop case uh, 
Uh, so in effect, you end up with a Raspberry Pi in a, in a carryable format. So all of those are now supported by that one card. Now, this is a fun quiz. I don't think he's, ch I, I can't decide whether that's an original photo or that's today. So, that, who, who's that? John John Mike, easy. That one's a bit harder. Oh, well, oh, yes, Helen Cole, German Chancellor, and a very young looking Phil Fenton. Why am I asking these ridiculous questions? This is a computer show. Uh, but no, uh, the thing that they all have in common was in 1992, they were all the people. <laughs> <laughs> they were all in power the last time the style guide was printed. So, back in 1992, Acorn thought, well, it'd be a really good idea to try and write down why how applications you should interact with applications. When you, when you click on the icon bar, what should happen? What should open a window? That's fairly obvious. How big should that window be? Should it be centered on the screen? What should be in the icon bar menu so that people can find things? Quit is always at the bottom. All of these things Acorn wrote down in, in 1992, uh, and then that was it. So uh, in February, uh, Rule launched an uh, updated style guide. So it filled in an awful lot of missing detail for example, previously there was no mention of the nested window manager, which actually came out in 1998, I think, so that kind of era. So you can already see that even on uh, even by Acorn standards, it was uh, lagging quite a long way behind. Uh, and also it didn't mention things like where your user choices are stored. Now, choices have been stored in the boot directory for definitely at least for more than 10 years, possibly getting on to 1992. So it's a big effort by Mr. Open to turn that into a, back into a physical book again as a first trial to see whether people have an appetite for actual books. So you can go and buy that from the stand. This is this is a proof <coughs> that I bought with me. Um, so you can buy that from the stand for £16, which if you use your pocket calculator, that's a Sinclair pocket calculator from 1992, um, you'll find that this was originally sold for 9 95 I think, by Acorn. So if you allow for 23 years worth of inflation, it's actually the same price, it's just a, a different number. <coughs> Your pound is worth a lot less. <coughs> why uh, first class stamps aren't 12p anymore, which is why I remember they were there. Uh, if you're a developer, uh, if you've got a dev 07 serial number, which quite a lot of people were if you've been writing software, uh, you can also get a 20% discount, so it's in real terms it's even less. Then in March, again giving credit to CJ Micros, twice in one day if that's wrong, um, uh, CJ Micro has kindly uh, sponsored Edit to upgrade that to um, to upgrade that to use the cut and paste clipboard model. And if I refer back to the 1992 text, I'll find that that's what Acorn said they should have done anyway. <laughs> so it's a great example of do as I say uh, and not as I do. So Acorn mandated that stop using the silly Edit model and use cut and paste like every other computer in the world. So uh, CJ Micros was very kind in uh, helping push that over the line. All right, so obviously you've got the, all the extra bits and bobs, cut and paste, uh, select and clear. That's actually the uh, a menu capture from Source Edit, which is Edit's bigger brother, which allows you to write programs as well. Uh, but it, it's almost identical other than that to normal edit. Slipping out almost into present time, April 2015. Uh, Pico was updated within the last two weeks, possibly three weeks ago, uh, to support the Mark II Raspberry Pi and the B Plus, because when the original 50th birthday happened, neither of those machines existed. So uh, the obvious physical incompatibility was the card didn't fit in the socket. So uh, there's now an updated version of Pico available. Uh, and if you go over to the stand, just to the left of the rule stand, you'll find in flat pack format uh, is a, a computer controlled robot arm uh, which you can help build which the Pico has drivers to drive because it's just, just a USB peripheral. Uh, so if you want to, I'm sure what, you can get it to do some real, really menial tasks like a folding wedding invites or something like that. Um, so you, can, you can build one of those and if you want to get one yourself they're available from Maplin if there's a Maplin in your, in your uh, high street they're about £45, something like that from Maplin. And yesterday, getting right up to date, an exciting new product launch. As you can see here, various different models of pointless arm candy. <laughs> the more important release yesterday was RISC 5.22. Uh, it was somewhat overshadowed by a, a fruit based company somewhere in California. <laughs> Not heard of them, they're probably a minority system. Um, 
So this is now available. Um, I may well be on the website now. It wasn't as at 11 o'clock last night, but it's it's somewhere going to appear on the website very shortly. Uh, available for the Beagle board, Panda board, if you've got an Ionix, a Risk PC, the A7000, the A7000 Plus, which is all of the uh, all of the supported stable platforms. Um, there's a big pile of release notes that I won't bore you with because there's 450 changes to describe. I'll be able to run my three, three quarters of an hour slot. Um, and uh, there are um, available on CD um, immediately versions of all of those. You can't wait for the download, uh, which is coming in the next couple of days. So you can support Restless Open by buying the corresponding CD. Anyone who's been to the stand may have noticed there are a few things out of stock, which is bad. CGA Micros would not let us do this. Um, the Nut Pie is not currently available today because it's, it's just being rebuilt at the moment to support the Mark II Raspberry Pi. So, um, as you may have noticed, or very subtly noticed earlier, the, uh, the processor that's on this is now an ARM Architecture 7, which, due to the way that ARM have renumbered all of their processors, is newer than an ARM 11, which is the ones it used to be on. So I'm glad that's clear. Um, unfortunately, that means that some of the applications that previously worked on the ARM 11 don't work on the newer Mark II Raspberry Pi. So that's being updated uh, with all of the titles from the uh, various developers. It's a slightly complicated uh, process because there are so many people involved. You need to obviously email them all around and get them all to do the changes. So. It was almost available for today. I, I've seen a, a prototype version of it, but uh, unfortunately it missed the cut for uh, duplicating cards. So hopefully in the next few days that will be announced uh, and you'll be able to do some kind of upgrade strategy if you've already bought it. I'm not sure quite how that will work, whether you buy a blank card or you get a download, something like that. So you can upgrade your uh, existing nut pipe. So that's it. That's, that, will, that should take us till the middle of next week. Uh, but. No one ever sleeps at rural headquarters. Uh, there's also, to complement or to follow up uh, after the success of the original, uh, after the reprint of the style guide, um, developers, and this is uh, if you want to go and see it on Amazon, uh, you probably can't read the URL from over there, but go and look at it on Amazon. Uh, there's a new set of the desktop development environment books, which is a weighty 1.8 kilos of stuff to read. So if anyone has uh, sleeping problems, or <laughs> maybe they've got a table leg that's a bit wobbly. Uh, those are ideal set of books uh, to also prop up your table and help you sleep at night. So that covers the uh, compiler, um, and all the mystical switches used uh, to generate C code, uh, the assembler, obviously, uh, and then there's a, a combined book which deals with all of the rest of the tools called the desktop tools, which is, uh, for example, things like the debugger are all covered in there. So it's part of a, an ongoing uh, creeping forwards of bringing all the documentation up to date because, as I say, essentially it all stopped in 1994 and nothing's happened since then. Right, you've listened to me prattling on for a while. Um, you can get involved, that's good. So it's, it's a very passive way of delivering information to people, having them uh, sit and watch me. Uh, there are around 2,500 accounts on the rural forum so if you have a question and you ask it on the forum, there are probably 2,499 other people who might know the answer to that. And they're likely to be able to get back to you pretty quickly on it. So it can be trivial things like, uh, I don't know, how do I format my hard disk? Someone on there will know the answer to that question. There's a more direct way to get involved by emptying your bank account <laughs> into the rural bank account, all denominations taken. Uh, you can take Turkish Lira before it goes bust. Um, and those will be routed towards the, uh, the bounties. Uh, interesting, a, a quick calculation from the website shows that on average, oh, surprisingly generous, uh, on average the donation is about £30. So I don't know how, how you compare that. If you, uh, if you came here by train today, I suspect your train ticket probably cost more than £30, depending on how far you live away. So it would cost more than £30 to get here from Cambridge. So it's not a massive amount of money, uh, and it's what ultimately is, is uh, helping drive Risk forward in some of those big ticket items that never got done, like cut and paste and edit. And if you're really brave, uh, every night the, uh, there's a server somewhere in, uh, a server up in the cloud somewhere, 
that spits out a nightly build with all the latest possibly broken versions of RISC-OS to for you to try out. And it's really important to get the feedback from that. I, I, I guess I'm speaking in jest in that it, it may destroy your computer and erase all of your files. Yes. Uh, <laughs> swings around a bit. Um, but it's important to know that because if no one tests it, then that just that bug stays in there forever. It's important to get to, to have people, particularly if you've got, say, a spare machine. You know, you can buy a Raspberry Pi for 25 quid. Why not have two of them? One that you're actually using, and the other one that you throw nightly builds onto that occasionally will catch fire. <laughs> I think that's a good whisk through a year. Uh, are there any questions that I might reasonably know the answer to? Are you going to release an open source AHCI driver? Because uh, I'm aware that someone's recording, I'm going to say your question back to you in a slightly weird way so they're recording here. But are you going to open are you going to release an open source AHCI driver? Uh, so AHCI, in case anyone doesn't know, is the advanced host controller interface which is used to talk to SATA hard disks. So um, the original RISC PC had hard disks with a big 40 way ribbon cable uh, snaking its way across the motherboard. The more recent ones have SATA connectors, which is a much, a much smaller connector, and therefore it's a drive that you can actually buy because no one manufactures part of drives anymore, the original ATA drives. So uh, at the moment, I don't know of any plans. Uh, I think it's probably the answer. Uh, it would make sense to because any computer that is made or any computer that is being made now will have a SATA interface on it. Um, nothing, as I said, no one manufactures part of drives anymore, so there's no point in making a computer with a, a parallel interface on it. So yes, it's going to become a thing that, uh, it's going to become a chink in RISC-OS's hardware armor, yes. In the same way that when the OMAP 3 port first came out, there was no SD card driver, so you couldn't do anything with it. So yes, it would be great to see something coming along that front. Don't forget, it's, the, the driver is the bottom bit that just talks to the, to the connector. You also need a filing system on top of that, and then the desktop filer, so there's, there's not just one module, it could be a three, a three module stack. Seriously, bamboos for everyone. <laughs> 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 so, so you've talked a lot about um, uh, the Pi and um, the change from, from single. There was the original single core, there's the quad core version, and a lot of the other products are now multiple cores. Uh, and so, is there any plans to, in effect, start branching out so that uh, risk ops can use those other ports as part of the open source stack? Okay, yeah, so you're asking if uh, it's possible to use other cores either now or in the near future on these more recent platforms that have multi-core or processes. is it in your development plan? So uh, a less less well visited part of the rule website is the risk West Open roadmap. Um, there, there really is one. Uh, and, and that's certainly one of the things on there, yes. And I know that there have been lots of discussions on how best to implement it. Uh, it's possibly one of those things where you, you just make a start on it, knowing that you probably end up with a wrong solution. But in having done that and got to the wrong solution, you know why you got it wrong. Uh, there are certainly plenty of big, complicated uh, or hardware projects, but software projects that I've worked on where you have a first go at it, knowing that that's never going to ship, you just throw it away. But the, the expertise that you gain along the way, you suddenly find, um, you know, if, you, if you split you know, the window manager across two cores, then suddenly find that you, know, you close one window over here and some other window redraws for no apparent reason in the other corner. You, you'll find a load of wrinkles. It's, it's not just as simple as turning the core on and going, oh, great, I've got four computers now. There needs to be the talking between the cores and ultimately there's, there's only one kernel and the kernel has to know, you know who's got all the memory. Because in the case also, in the case of Pi, that one gigabyte of RAM is shared between the four cores. So on boot up, give it 256 meg per core, that's probably a reasonable policy. Maybe you only want to turn on two cores, you have 512 meg each. Someone somewhere has to be allocating that memory and keeping track of everything. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think the usual phrase is non-trivial. Uh, <laughs> my suspicion would be, have a go at something, it's probably going to be wrong and you'll throw it away, but you'll have learned a lot along the way. 
I saw the question for that was really uh, around the PC card type approach as to whether on, on a separate core you could have something like Linux that could be used to overcome some of the sort of current software deficiencies and risk costs. Yes, so the, the previous example of using a PC card as, as a second processor to an ARM processor um, does have a lot of parallels in what is required in order to uh, run a multi-core ARM system. So the PC card was quite unusual in that it grabbed a lump of RAM and there was a big ASIC that worked out all and did all the handshaking on the bus to work out which processor was supposed to be using which bit of RAM at which time, which is why it was amazingly expensive. Um, so yes, th there's a lot of parallels that I can think of. Uh, for example, I, I much prefer things in beige cases. So the BBC Micro had exactly the same thing. It had one master system. Oh, that's a good pun. Yeah, it had, had, one, <laughs> had, one, it had one central system, which was the host. It was a, a, the dominant part of the relationship. And then there was the coprocessor, which was essentially a dumb slave that just did computing stuff and sent messages back and forth. So that's a, a, a very good example of one first implementation might be set a core up, don't put any risk on it at all, just have it passing messages, and, and then farm off computing jobs. I, I mentioned earlier in my talk, Spark FS is a, my easiest, the easiest example that springs to my mind. Compressing a file, what is that? It's a big pile of RAM here, compress it, give it me back again. You don't need any OS calls at all. In principle, you don't need any OS calls at all, other than to give me some data, I'll squeeze it and give it you back again. The whole of RISC-OS could then remain unaware of it, and then you have a, a tube module or whatever the <laughs> whatever the BBC Micro parallel would be, which does the inter-process communications. And that's how a lot of embedded systems work. You have um, you, you, you send everything down, it's usually called message pipes or queues. So you have one central person in charge and then you just pass messages between each other. So yeah, that, that's another approach, yeah. Oh. So following on from that. Um, does anybody know if uh, Simtech ever released um, the bits and pieces behind Hydra? So they obviously did. they had multi multi processor; they could farm stuff off. Yes. So yeah, did Simtech ever release the Hydra stuff? As far as I know, no. Uh, unfortunately, not. I think what they found there was that it was a classical computing problem named after somebody whose name I've entirely forgotten because it's been too long since I've been at university. Um, where the overhead of doing the communications cancels out the effort of making the communication in the first place. Right. So there's, there's a, it's probably a, an, an inverse square law or something. Every, everything is either, either inverse square or pi. So, um, <laughs> so that's all I remember from maths. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, so if, if you think I'm going to farm out this little bit of computing work and it's going to take you five milliseconds to do the computation and then you're going to send me the answer back, or maybe actually I could have done it myself in less time than that five milliseconds would have been, and overall I've not gained anything. It's the problem that uh, if you make a transcomputer, <laughs> they have exactly the same problem. You have hundreds and hundreds of cores, and you actually spend almost all of your time just sending messages between us off. No one's actually doing any calculations anymore. So yeah, there's definitely a, a place to work out where to put the dividing line, and I think that was the problem that Hydra had. Sounds what? like the public service. <laughs> yes, yes, so yeah. you can apply it to yeah, paperwork, paperwork to get an Indian visa. That seems to have an awful lot of message passing and very little work being done. Um, but yes, the um, Hydra, I think, suffered from a similar problem. I also know, or that I, I, uh, I know of the person who wrote a thing that was called Super FPM, I think it was called, which essentially used the floating point coprocessor unit on the PC card to in, in a replacement for the floating point emulator module that's normally on the ARM. And that all worked great when it was an ARM 6, an ARM 7, yeah, it's still okay. You see, it was a, still a net win to send the message, do the computation, send the answer back. As soon as the strong ARM came out, it just wasn't worth sending the message. It killed itself. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's a difficult problem and I'm sure there are many people thinking how best to solve it. But as far as I know, nothing for Hydra, sorry. <laughs> Three questions. <laughs> oh. You asked me all of you. Uh, is that now how it's sort of chip or service being able to look at it and in terms of uh, its programs? Is that something now that will work across all the range of the <laughs> processes? Uh, so like you know, the newest Pi, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's a big report. Okay, 
Okay, yeah, so you're asking about whether the uh, US, USB audio can now be implemented. I think the short answer to your question is yes. Um, so there's a, a module called USB audio, <laughs> uh, which is which is sort of doing the equivalent of the, um, the SCSI switcher module. So when we first got USB stick support, what you need is a little bit of glue that goes from the USB stack and all the weird transactions as it does back into something that's more useful that people other bits of the stack understand. So the SCSI switcher bridges between the USB stack and the rest of SCSI filing system. So yeah, we needed or we need or needed a similar system where you've got the USB stack, you need a thing to bridge to the rest of the audio system. Now I think there's some debate still whether how you best integrate that. So that there's one logical implementation mm -hmm is to make it just look like another audio sync, another another audio device. So in the same way that your wrist PC has a speaker, the path to get to that speaker is you go through the sound scheduler, through the sound DMA driver, which then converts it through a digital to analog, digital to analog converter, and then puts that out on the speaker. So in principle, if you remove that bottom bit, the sound DMA module, and replace it by a USB audio module, you would then be able to plug in uh, your USB audio peripherals, so it would be a headphone or as you can get microphones, yeah. jacks, so yeah, so they couldn't open the USB. The second piece of the jigsaw puzzle is that there are some fixes needed uh, to the USB stack because USB audio is unusual in that it uses a thing called isochronous transfers. Uh, not, nothing, not those types of socks though. Um, so uh, there are various different modes of sending data via USB. So something like a keyboard uses interrupt transfers. So only when you press a keyboard does anything actually happen. Isochronous is one that is, well, ISO means same and isochronous is to do with time. So every, every beat of the drum, some more audio samples will arrive. And it doesn't matter, occasionally you might lose the odd one. And for audio that generally doesn't matter if you lose the odd sample every now and then. Uh, so you keep sending the samples at a regular regular beat uh, and in some of the USB drivers for some of the platforms there are some bugs in that so that they need fixing as well so there is some work being done by uh, Colin Granville uh, which is sitting somewhere in the rule submissions queue because it needs a really good check here but you don't want to change the USB stack you find oh the keyboard doesn't work <laughs> uh, so there's, there's some rather rather careful checking but yes I, I believe USB audio is imminent, if not sitting in somebody's inbox, waiting for it to be uh, implemented. Yeah. Oh. Has anything been done about the uh, format of the large drives? So H form, anything been done with H form? <laughs> so H form will format up until 256 gigabytes. Um, beyond that, you need to get a 4K sector drive, which will allow you to get to two terabytes. So you can get a bit bigger, but the storage industry has continued to shoehorn more and more bits onto their bits of spinning rust. So uh, there's still quite there's still quite a discrepancy between the biggest size that uh, that H form can handle and the biggest size that you can buy in PC World. The reason for that is nothing to do with the formatter. The formatter is just a bit BBC Basic that just calls a few file core wise. The important bit, as I've just swept under the carpet, is file core. So file core has a limitation, uh, and depending on check how many people are still awake. So there's a 32-bit there's a number internally that gets passed around inside Filecore, which is called the internal disk address. So 32 bits is the first number to remember. And remember that there are eight drives in Filecore, four floppy and four hard disks. So log to the base two of eight is three. So 32 minus those three bits, which you've just used up for drive numbers, gives you 29 bits. And two to the power of 29 behold is 256 gigabytes when expressed in sectors. So that's where the ultimate limit comes from. It's, it's not the format that's the problem, it's that Filecore only knows how to address 2 to the power of 29 sectors. Um, so if you want to get a little bit bigger you can go to 4K sectors and that gets you to 2 terabytes because that's 2 to the 29 times 4,000. But beyond that some serious rogueworks is required in Filecore and that's the subject of one of the bounties is Someone needs to pop the bonnet up on file core and uh, have a go. <laughs> have a go out trying to expand that. And the obvious way you can easily get a factor of eight by removing the drive bits out of the top of that 32-bit number. Then you can have two to the power of 32 sectors. So you get a factor of eight with, without breaking into too much of a sweat. But really, I think the storage industry is probably already a factor of eight further away 
anyone knows you can get 16 terabyte drives now? Probably. Feels it's, it's probably not that six is, six is. Yeah, so it's, we're within a factor of two of what is current technology. So I, my feeling is it's probably wasted effort trying to squeeze that extra factor of eight out. It really needs changing to be 64 bits. So you can get, I think it's, that gives you 16 exabytes, which is it's something like more storage than has ever been created on Earth, or something. It's 16 exabytes, or all of Google's all of Google's uh, data centers. So the size of the drive is not the thing that is going to trip people up. It's the size of the files. So the biggest, the big API change, or the big scary change that people are, are dodging, is that all of the APIs, when you want to try and open a file, all expect a 32-bit file size. So the, the drive size has historically already been massively bigger than four gigabytes, as you know, you can already get four, the drive bigger than four gigabytes. So the, the size of the drive is not a problem, that's all hidden away inside file core. It's the size of the biggest file, which is where all the API breakage will happen, because you've run out of bits again. Yes. They were very future thinking when making the BBC Micro and having all of the APIs be 32 bits. I'm quite, quite pleased that someone thought that far ahead, but I guess they didn't think uh, 30 three years in the future. So, shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, well done. Tap dancing or something. <laughs>